So influence means inflow, to be in the river with. So when you want to influence somebody, first of all, you need to get into their river. You need mm -hmm. to work out where they're already going and join them, join the patterns, understand the patterns. You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hi, Mark. Welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Hala, great to be here. Thanks for having me. I am super excited for this conversation. We've had many conversations on Clubhouse, but this is the first time we have a video one-on-one -on -one and I just get to speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm super excited because you are known to be the pioneer of human behavior and body language related to influence and persuasion. So you are the guy that we have today. Um, it's my favorite topic in the world, human behavior, so can't wait to dig into all of it. But first, we like to start off with childhoods. So mm -hmm. I read and, and heard that you had dyslexia when you were younger and it really troubled you you know you were you were pretty behind in terms of your level of reading and writing growing up and I want to know how that impacted your confidence how that impacted your self-esteem and even how that shaped you later on as an adult uh, with your career choices and things like that yeah lovely so yes I'm, I'm I'm dyslexic and I've had it from being a little kid but was not diagnosed in any way back back then so things could be a little bit tricky as I'm sure other others who are dyslexic may have appreciated themselves now you know I, I did pretty well because I could find ways of getting around stuff and through stuff and under stuff and and through the system uh, and others uh, you know don't have that it's not really luck they just don't get to where I've I've got to through throughout through whatever methods but anyway you know yes reading and writing was pretty hard for me at, at the same time as you know we were streamed in school into kind of sets of ability and there would be areas like visual art where I was super super able and and spoken language where I was very very able and then reading and writing and mathematics the very lowest of the low simply because I couldn't get the letters in the right order or the numbers in the right order it's, it's not that I didn't understand words I understood them incredibly well or numbers I understood them incredibly well it's just what happens in my head doesn't end up down on a piece of paper so it was it was tricky and it meant that at school in some subjects I hung out with all kinds of all kinds of people at all kinds of levels of ability. I saw the whole spectrum of ability because there I was at the top and at the very bottom at the same time. It's super interesting how your greatest weakness can also be your greatest strength because I imagine because you couldn't do the reading and writing, like you said, your communication skills were off the charts. Probably your natural ability to read human body language and kind of be good in the real world, not just on paper, was strengthened. Is that correct? Yeah, so I think, look, I don't think I had abilities any more than anybody else. I was really keyed into the visual world because I was good at that. And I, I was able to make connections that others clearly couldn't make. I could, you know, um, I could metaphorically and, and in reality draw lines between points that other people weren't able to draw the lines between. So, so mm. that was, was really useful. Having said that, uh, I'm always a bit wary of, of your failures being your greatest strength because they, they, they also are very painful. They also can mm. be heartbreaking and, and really hard um, to, to deal with. So my, my failures were my greatest failures <laughs> and, my, <laughs> and my, my strengths were my, my strengths. And, and I guess, therefore, you know, what we have to do is really always concentrate on the, on the strengths uh, there, I think. Mm. But, but look, you know, the reason I think I partly got into loving human behavior is that the world was not very understandable for me. You know, imagine a world where you are really good at some stuff, you know, and then you are the biggest failure at, at other stuff. 
it's it's hard to work out how that world functions and why does that person tell me I'm so good at this and then at this other thing say I'm lazy and stupid and incompetent Mm. like what is it about human beings that would mean I could be at both ends of that spectrum and other people would treat me as both ends of that spectrum so I, it was a bit of a mystery to me so I did used to kind of go around the planet trying trying to work out why is it like this why is it so bizarre that I can be in these two different points at the same time what's going on here so that I think that's why I got into human behavior and psychology and influence and persuasion Yeah, that's super interesting. I also read or I can't remember if I read or heard it, but you were interested in marine biology, correct? And, And the study of animal behavior. So what was so interesting about that? Well, uh, first of all, you know, we used to, as a kid, we used to go on holiday a lot by the by the sea. I'm from from the UK, from England specifically. Was born there, and as you know, we're an island, so so we're surrounded by sea. So it doesn't take you very long to travel before you get to the sea, and you start going. Well, what's what's in the sea, and what's over the sea, and and you know, it's an island nation, and so island nations often quite traditionally can be quite isolated and insular, and at the same time. They they often are trying to work out how they got to get off the island, how they protect themselves from others who are not on that island on the big, you know, amounts of land and how they might get off it. So um, so I was really interested in 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 the sea and. And just water moves in an incredible way and stuff within water moves in an incredible way. You know, we, we, we spend some of our time in water as human beings and we're fascinated by water, um, but we generally live on the land. And so, you know, we've, we've got this body that is really adapted very, very well for kind of walking around and sitting around and doing stuff on land. And so when you hit the water and you see marine life, I think our mind can often go, wow, how is, how is that like that? I mean, we've got literally, we've got mammals in the water, you know, your dolphins, your whales, um, sea lions and stuff, which are descendant from ground dwelling mammals. You know, so this is, this is you know, in, in, in terms of evolution, the fish got out of the sea, they became mammals, you know, reptiles and then mammals. And then some of the mammals went, ah, I kind of like the sea. And, and they went back <laughs> in again. And so you get these sea dogs, sea lions, sea, sea cats, you know sea dogs you you get you get all of these things it's like it was what a weird adaption so i was you know fascinated by how how the movement of of water instead of how we move on land or in air and then your in terms of your studies and your evolution to your career now you got into the performing arts Correct. And you also yeah. studied art and how, you know, moving, moving art can can influence our human behavior. So talk to us about that. How did that set the foundation for your career later on? Yes. So um, I got specifically very good at at imagery. And I think mm-hmm. that that, as you suggested early on, that's partly because of the dyslexia and and the adaption to what I could get really good at and where I could draw the lines between really, really well. And so, and I got into theatre and film and TV and and especially like, how do you tell tell stories with those moving pictures? And how do those affect us as as human beings? We're obviously very, very visual. These eyes are very expensive to have. And there's a big neocortex that, that is very expensive to run as well, to do this visual part of our brain so vision is super important to us as as human beings and so i got fascinated by how do these moving pictures affect our predictions about the world around us because our brain is not a knowledge machine it's a best guess machine Mm. and it starts to look for specific patterns and then do its best guess as to what that pattern might mean to us and so i started to think about you know, what if we could make these patterns on purpose for each other to influence and persuade, to deliver to an audience the world that they expect or they don't expect and to change their thoughts and feelings? And so, yeah, I started studying in in film and TV and theatre and visual theatre, specifically movement theatre. Uh, and then uh, in visual arts as well. And I've become, you know, over the time, quite a collector of, of art because uh, I'm just still fascinated in that, that world of pattern and color 
and imagery and signals and what they signify and how that affects us as human beings. Mm, that is super interesting. I'm going to dig into some of that later on in this sure. interview. Okay, so let's set some ca- context for, for people who don't know. Let's talk about the animal and reptile brain. Mm, yeah, so, so look, um, we've got this brain and in evolutionary terms, it's about 500 million years old. So we're going to take evolution as a given, by mm-hmm. the way, 500 million years old. And the, the oldest part of it, we can call the reptilian brain or the, the most primitive brain. And that's now the, some people call it the brainstem, the R complex. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a whole bunch of names for it. All of them are potentially wrong because because it's all one brain. You know, this is just our way of best guessing at, at what is happening up here. So it's what we call a model, and all models are incorrect. That just some are more helpful than others. And the helpful way I like to think about the brain is: you've got this primitive brain, this reptilian brain, five hundred million years old. It's running your heart bre- heartbeat, your breathing rate. It's the thing that causes you to shiver when you go into a cold shower. Mm. It's very diff- difficult to control. You can countermeasure it if you know what stimulus is coming. Like if you know you're going to shiver in the shower, you can brace yourself for it. Okay, and you can kind of pretend you're not shivering, and you might get somewhat of a way on that but if I surprise you with a cold bucket of water your instinct you know your reflexes are going to take over so there's this reflex part of the brain there's what we call the social mammalian brain Uh, some people call that the limbic system I don't mind what you call some people will call it the amygdala probably all of those are incorrect again the important thing is is the model helpful which you've got this other kind of newer part of the brain maybe about kind of 5.5 million years old and that's running our social skills it's trying to help us understand is that person going to be a friend to us part of our group for us are they going to be a good friend for life can we do commerce with them do they hold the same value system as us so can we trust them so there's that social mammalian part of the brain and then you've got this super new part of the brain called the neocortex that's why it's called the neocortex new brain and that's about two hundred thousand years old it's the reason we can read and and write and have such a dexterous language skill and also quite a dexterous motor neuron skill in our in our fingers as well like you know uh, a monkey has got a neocortex or or, or or a cortex but it's not as big as ours and it's not as complex as ours and so therefore it's never going to play chopin okay mm. it's just not going to be able to to do that, never going to do it. Uh, can accidentally hammer out a few keys, but it's never going to do that. So, yeah, we've got these three parts of the brain. Some people call it the triune brain system. Again, it's not actually how your brain is; it's a model of it. It's all one brain. Okay. Anyway, I hope that helps, uh, Hala. That really helps. It's, it's it's super interesting to think that we have different parts of our brains that evolved at different times and we've got to deal with all of that at the same time. And a lot of it we don't have any control over. So I think that is super interesting. So you are the pioneer of influence and persuasion. And a lot of people bucket those two things together. They think influence and persuasion are the same. Talk to us about why they're different. Like what are the definitions of those two words? Yeah, so let's go to the the, the definitions of them. Uh, Influence, I think it's medieval Latin, so it has kind of French Latin derivation to it or etymology. Uh, So influence means in flow, to be in the river with. So when you want to influence somebody, first of all, you need to get into their river. You need Mm -hmm. to work out where they're already going and join them, join the patterns, understand the patterns. So one of the first, therefore one of the first keys of influence for me is, can you be influenced by them? Can you, if you wanna influence, if you want to influence them, can they influence you? Can you join them? Can you be sympathetic? Can you be empathetic? Can you be emotionally empathetic and cognitively empathetic as well? So can you, can you join in their feeling and can you think about their feeling as well at the same time? So have some cognitive understanding. So that's influence. Can you get in the same space as them and really start to understand it so that you could now start to lead where you're going, start to produce behaviors and ideas that because you're now part of a group, they might follow you 
because your behaviors seem useful to them, seem quite enjoyable, and they trust you now because you've been sympathetic and empathetic. Now, then there's persuasion. Now, persuasion, the etymology of that is to move hard. Hmm. Yeah. And so in persuasion, so if we think about this metaphor of the of the river, so so influence and persuasion is a river and you get in the river with them and you, you know, you're floating down the lazy river with them or you or you, you know, you, you're swimming along hard with them and you're in the same flow as that where that river is inevitably going for them because they're kind of in charge of the feeling at that point. Well, as you're going along and they start to trust you, you can start to go, there are confluences in the river. There are different directions we could take. And you can start to describe those different opportunities in front of them. And as you describe those, you can kind of stack the deck. You can describe some as more valuable than others. You can evaluate uh, the, the, the choices for them. And because they trust you and you've been along the journey so far with them, they'll trust your description. And sometimes they might ask you, well, what do you think I should do? Where, which way should we go? And they might even take your advice. Or you might even be able to go, look, we need to go this way. And they go, I trust you, Mark. Let's do that. Mm. Okay. So that's, that's, Influence and persuasion, they're two kind of different, um, I guess, tones or elements. And if you can get both together really, really well, you can help people get what they really need and, and not necessarily just what they want or think they should have. You can help them get what they really need and would be more beneficial for them. And sometimes you can help get what you really need out of them and the situation as well. And when both are aligned, then you've got a really good uh, relationship, a good society, a good group, a good piece of commerce. Hope that mm. explains that well enough for you, Hala. It does. It does. Okay, so let's talk about values because I know that mm. one of the first things that we need to do if we want to be good at influence and persuasion is to understand the other person's values. So talk to us about the methods that we can do that without being so obvious because if we say, like, what are your values? It's super obvious <laughs> yeah. what we're trying well, to do. Yeah. So how do we get around that? Well, and also if you say to somebody, hey, what are, you, what are your values? People will come up with, the, with stuff that they think they should be saying. Mm. Uh, like how many times have you looked at a website and it says we value, you know, one of our values is integrity. <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, that sounds like it just came off the back of the cereal packet of, of, of websites. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying the person doesn't have integrity. It's just most people don't ever use the word integrity other than situations where they're trying to build a website and tell people that they can be trusted or they're trying to, you know, show themselves at that specific point that they're a good person. They're kind of signaling some kind of virtue. But in general conversation, they're not going, hey, you know, um, I, I hope, you know, I hope you saw how integrated I was <laughs> or did you see my integrity or I'm hoping I'm hoping, you know, that that you understand my integrity. It's not it's not language that we use. So, so, so we need people to tell us the language that they're using and the things that they're choosing for being the most important things in their world, in the, in the world that they, that they see. Okay. And so we need kind of an interview technique that will, or some questioning that will elicit from them, um, a, a hierarchy of <laughs> uh, what is most important to you. Uh, about okay mm -hmm. so actually Hala, let me let me try this with with you because i know oh. yeah yeah so i know um i know you do a lot of these uh uh podcasts with all kinds of of people and thanks for having me uh on here it's great great to be here what's most what's most important for you about when you choose you know a guest to have to have on what's what's most important for you I like when somebody has a specific expertise on a topic. I don't want to have a conversation about everything because then we're having a conversation about nothing. So I like a specific right. expertise. I like to make sure that they have lots of material, lots of opinions on the matter. They've written a book. They've written multiple yeah. books. They've done speeches. They know their stuff and I can really go deep. So that's what I look for. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so while you were while you're doing that, I'm right scribbling down notes here, mm-hmm. and I'm scribbling down what you put most emphasis on. Yeah, because okay. you said a lot of words there, all good words, but some words seem to have more value mm. than others, and the words that seem to have more value was specific specific the idea of specific and when i look around at your like how you appear to me yeah and how you've shown up in this frame it's it's not very busy what's happening there there's really kind of specific choices that you've that you've made like the background is very much all you know one thing these shiny things one mic there one color here you know one kind of style of and you and you're showing up with with usually the same style each time every time i've noticed it so you clearly like things being specific really clear yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um and opinion you like opinion <laughs> yeah you like so there's knowledge okay and there's lots of stuff but what does that specific person think specifically about mm-hmm. this and 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 so they know their they know their stuff and i think what you mean by stuff is having a specific opinion about a field yeah correct so that you can go deep so you want to go deep rather than shallow across everything you can you can pick out somebody from um from an area yeah, a field, but then you're going, well, who could go deepest and most specific about that? Now, as I'm feeding those back to you, I'm starting to see where you're doing slow blinks to me, which are moments of recognition. And when you're, you know, moving your head up and down as well, agreeing (laughs) with me. And as we start to have a conversation together, I can now get really specific with you about using some of your, yeah, and so you nodded your head and you gave me a little blink that on that <laughs> word specific with you, okay? Yeah, there you go again. So now I'm, I'm testing out these valuable words, which, which may hint towards, I'm not saying I've got this exactly right, but I'm on the path now to getting this more right by, by getting out of you, Give me a quick hierarchy about X. I could have done it on anything, okay? Could have done it on anything. I could, I could, I could, I could have gone. Um, I could have gone. Hey, hey, Hala, I, I know, I know. Just like everybody else on the, on the, you know, in our world, you must go shopping at at, at some point. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm just curious. Like, what's the most important thing for you when you go and buy something? What's the most? Actually, just let me know that. What's the most important thing for you? weird question i know when you go and buy something uh in terms of clothing or just anything sure that's a great yeah. idea yeah well i like it to be very fashionable i like yeah. it to fit me nicely i like it to be yeah. super high quality yeah um and just stylish yeah yeah okay i like all of those things yeah, lovely. So again, notice how I'm going to pick up what super high quality you said, and there was a really you know, <laughs> stylish. Okay, so now I can go. Get, now I can go. I want to give you a really specific answer on this because I want it to be high quality for you. And so at that point, I'm now learning about your hierarchy system and trying to feed back to you. I'm trying to get in the river with you about about that. So I don't judge, because I may have a different value system. I, I don't, but, but I may have a di- And in fact, one of the reasons we might get on and this interview might go well is because we share some of the same values. But what I don't want to do is ever let you see that I might not share some of those values, because we won't, we won't get on. Mm-hmm. Like the moment I say to you, uh, if I said to you, Hala, I understand that you, you think high quality is important in in clothing, but I think for myself, and I think for a lot of other people, it isn't really the most important thing at all. I think you can, and stylish, I mean, I think really just get get something at a, at a low price, even if it's gonna fall to bits, yeah, and just keep on, keep moving on and kind of cycling through, quickly through clothing, you know, because then that's kind of, <laughs> right, can you see how your brain is going, uh, no, Mark, no, you got it <laughs> no, wrong. No, thank you. You know, thank you. You got it all wrong, okay? And, and often it's the value system that causes people to have argument and the value system that causes people to get on. And so I can purposely 
interview you for your value system, start to feed that back to you so we can get on better. Now, why would I want to get on better with you? Well, you know, the answer to that is, well, why not? Why, why, why shouldn't we try and get on better than get on worse? It's, and if I can get on better on purpose, why wouldn't I just do it on purpose? There's a lot of people out there that might go, hey, look, Mark, you're either going to get on or you're not going to get on and you should be authentic. And, and I kind of go, no, I, I can get on on purpose with people. I could try and get on with people who I instantly go, I think I'm going to get on with them. And I could purposely try and get along with them better because that stops me missing great opportunities. Yeah, I, I think I think it kind of just helps accelerate a relationship. And if it's not going to work out, you kind of get the idea. Well, quicker, like sooner than later, you figure out that it's not going to work out. Right. Because there might be values that you start signaling, which I go with the best will in the world. I'm not going to join in with that. I'm just mm -hmm. not going to mm -hmm. do it, you know, either because in my well, you got to watch your gut feeling on values because that's about comfort level. OK, yeah. your gut feeling about a value system can be about comfort level, not that it's a bad value system. It's just I'm not used to that value system. Yeah, there are values that people can inform you of that cognitively you would go. I understand the history of that value. I understand the ramifications of that value. I'm actually I'm opposed to that value in it, in, not in a, in a gut instinct way, in a cognitive way. I it should not be valued. I will not join in on that. And then I could tell you immediately, I could say, Hala, this just isn't gonna, gonna work for me. Thanks for your time, but I think we should leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and move on. So, so we could accelerate a breakup faster, you know? And totally. also, also we could accelerate a, a getting on with each other faster as well. Yeah. So, let me just like repeat this back to you, make sure that I understand it. When somebody is talking and you're trying to figure out their values, you can ask them questions about basically anything and start to pick up on the words that they emphasize and then use those words in conversations to show them that you align with their values. Yeah. So you got you, in the questioning, you need to be a little bit specific. I'm going to use that word on you. <laughs> a little bit specific so you can go really deep with them on what for you is most important about. So you're looking for some kind of questioning that includes the idea of them delivering to you their hierarchy. What is most important? Because there are so many important things on the planet for them. What you want is the most important thing. Yes. Uh, or you could go, what do you most enjoy? You know, so if I want to find their va what part of their value system, I might go, so they might go, um, uh, you know, in small talk, I might, I might say, what did you do at the weekend? They might go, hey, I was hanging out with my family. Oh, great. Like, what do you most enjoy about hanging out with your family? So the moment you do that, you're going to get their hierarchy system mm. around being with family. Now, the, the presumption here is, is that values, ten, deeper values tend to go across all their behavior. So what is, what is within their value system for hanging out, hanging out in their family might be in there is most likely in their value system for who they do business with, how they choose something they buy, how they do a whole bunch of stuff. The value system will be fairly consistent if you can get specific and, and deep enough with mm. that. So you want a question that will elicit the most valuable, the most important, the most interesting. So, you know, they're talking about a subject and you go, so I'm just curious, what's most interesting for you about that subject? And again, it's that idea of the most that will elicit some words of, of real value. I hope that makes sense. It does. And, but then how do you go and use that then? So you figure out their value. How do you go and use that to then influence them? What is your best tactics there? So first of all, you show acceptance when they're, when they're saying those words. Yeah, and there's mm -hmm. lots of good nonverbal ways of showing acceptance. I will give them good eye contact. I'll gently smile. I'll be nodding my head. I'll even make little noises like, oh, hmm, oh. Yeah, and give them positive noises when they're, when they're saying those words, okay? And, and then I'll try and include some of those words or ideas when I'm, when I'm talking to them. 
Hmm. Again, I'm not trying to do it. Um, I mean, you know, I've been quite bold with you because we're trying to demonstrate this, okay? But it's usually going to be so subtle, they, they just aren't going to notice. And even if they did notice, it's too nice for them to get upset about it. It's just too... Because you can even tell them, tell somebody what you're doing. And, and part of the brain takes it in and part of the brain just goes, I don't care if I'm being influenced and persuaded here. It just feels too good. It's yeah. just too nice being accepted. I, I, I run by this idea that the moment we were born, really what we're looking for is acceptance. Because unless we get accepted, our chances of survival are so slim. Yeah, so, we, so acceptance is massively important. And we've got this radar going on all the time, going, am I getting accepted? Am I, you know, am I part of a group here? Let's just keep checking that out and, and gravitating towards the people who will accept me. So I hope that I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it's it does. And it's super powerful stuff. I love it. So let's talk about baselines, because I know mm. that establishing baselines is really important. And I'd love to understand the difference between traits and states and moods. Oh, yeah. OK. OK. So tra so so traits and states and moods. Is that is that what you said there? Yes. Yeah. OK. So, look, we could say about about you, Hala, that we could we could, you know, see certain traits about you. So there would be a trait. There's a, let's look at your speech patterns and there's some traits in your speech patterns or accent that kind of suggest to me are you from like near New York somewhere or correct. Is that right? New Jersey. Okay. Mm -hmm. New Jersey. I thought so. I thought so, because there's some traits in your speech that tell me um, because of how sometimes you're dropping some sounds, which gives it a really lovely feel to it that instantly makes me go, oh, that's, I think that's New Jersey, you know, and that would be a, be a trait and you, you, and that's, that's, but that's not a, a, um, a mood that you're in and that doesn't, that trait isn't probably going to change with your mood. Like mm. you're still going to have that same dropping of some parts of a word, whether you're happy or sad or angry or lonely or whatever it might be. OK. OK. So so that's a that's a trait. And we could, you know, baseline that that and go, OK, that's that's if that changes. Now, if that changes, wow, what's gone on here? What's gone on here if you start to include some of those starts and ends of words that as a trait you miss out on? You know, what, I, that, that for me, I would go, what's going on here? Why is that happening? That's, that's unusual. Like I may be more serious or mad or something like that. Okay, so you just gave me a clue there. You've kind of gone, hey, Mark, if I start being a little more, more proper proper <laughs> i'm probably serious now or i'm getting angry <laughs> yeah and, <laughs> and and so okay that's worth me knowing and 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 look in our conversation you kind of just gave me the clue there now that's not going to me that's not going to be the, the case every time okay so so there are no definites in this but it's a good clue all we're ever trying to do is get closer to the truth OK, we're trying to get more accurate and away from less accurate. OK, so that's good to know about you. Now, um, look, my you know, what I what I sense from you at the moment in your baseline, because you're working at the moment and this is your work. And my guess is, is you're good at this because you have you're able to produce this characteristic and, it, and, it, and it's relatively easy for you. Is your upbeat, your buoyant. Yeah, your positive, you know, in a situation where, like, you don't know what I'm going to say next, you, you have, you know, so you're managing quite a stressful situation here, but you're doing it at quite a buoyant level here. Mm -hmm. So you're creating, it's easy for you to create this mood of positivity, okay? And, and, and you know, because we're here together for, let's just say, around about an hour, my guess is, is you can sustain that mood for you know, an hour or more. In fact, you probably can go a whole day and, and sustain Correct. that. Yeah, sustain that kind of, kind of mood. So, 
So that's a mood. Moods, uh, we can create a mood or we can have a mood come upon us, you know, like a, like a weather system, like a dark cloud or a sunny day. And they can sustain, a moods can sustain like the weather for many, many hours, sometimes days, sometimes, you know, more than a day. But if it's going into days and days and days, then then we start to think about well what's really going on here why is why are they were in that weather pattern for so long why hasn't the weather changed for them and then at that point we might kind of go okay there's some kind of affective disorder here there might be um you know just to pick out a couple of things there might be mania or there might be depression you know it's always mm -hmm. just such a big sunny day all the time like, you know, Harley, if I didn't notice about you outside of this, that you weren't able to, like, you know, shut down and kind of go, OK, I'm done with that now. I'm going to have a bit of a rest. You know, that might that might indicate something of, well, you can't you can't lose this level of positivity all the time. And how's that going to function? Because sometimes human beings need to be negative about stuff. It's really important mm -hmm. to go with well, that and work. I don't like that. <laughs> you know, so look, there's that there's moods. And now there's states. So states, people can move and transition uh, between, and they can be quite heightened states. So you could have a state of an anxiety. But I, I would hope that your state of anxiety really heightened, like a really heightened state. I would hope it wouldn't last for more than about 10 minutes, because if you get a heightened state of anxiety for more than 10 minutes, that's real stress on your on your body so i would be you know i don't mind you being a bit worried for 10 minutes about about something and then your brain works it out or we're able to talk about it and go hey what are you worried about and then it it subsides but if it keeps on going at that high level yeah then then that could be it's just a lot of stress on your on your body so states often can't last at a heightened level for emotional states for more than about 10 minutes there's just too much pressure uh, yeah. on the body uh, anyway i hope that that answered your question that, was that does and that. so i guess the main reason why i wanted you to cover that is because i want people to understand that you do need to understand people's baselines so that you can see if their actions and behaviors actually mean something or not because if they're right. always like this and they're always like this and it doesn't matter it's not because you're boring or like let's say if somebody just talks really has is really slow in the way that they talk or something along those lines it might not mean that you're boring or they're uninterested it could just be that's the way that they are so you need to realize how they are so you can understand if what they do is meaningful or not in terms of their behavior correct yeah absolutely so when we're trying to look at behavior and trying to understand somebody I think the main thing that we're looking for is is notable change. That's the thing. And if we don't know the baseline, it's very hard to work out what a notable change would be. You start to have having to bunch people together and go, mm -hmm. well, people are generally like this. And so this is a deviation from the norm of people generally. Well, that might get you somewhat closer to the truth, but it's not as good as being able to go. I've looked at this person's behavior um, under other circumstances, similar circumstances. I've got a baseline. And so now we can look at significant deviation from that, from that baseline. Uh, you know, it's just like a doctor should, a good doctor should do. If you come in with a symptom, yeah, and, and you go, well, this is now hurting or this now troubles me. One of the things a doctor should be doing is like, well, what's, what's changed? What are you doing differently? Mm. because you didn't you weren't in here last week or the week before or the week before that or you haven't been in for a whole year or three years it's like you've never told me about this before what's going on they they, they they're going to look at your symptom and go what is the root cause they're try, hopefully trying to look not solve the symptom but deal with the root cause of it and if you won't change mm. your root cause like you know you come in with a bad elbow and they go, well, what's been happening? It's like, well, I've just, you know, it's the tennis tournament. <laughs> it's like, okay, I get it. Well, it's, you know, can you stop this hurting? It's like, yeah, can you stop playing tennis? 
because that's a sport. And with sport, if you're competitive, you will have injury. It's one of the things your other competitors are hoping for is that you get injured. You're hoping that they get injured. Okay, it's one, it's one of the things. Yeah, you're hoping to be a better player and you're hoping that their body can't take that level for as long as you can. So their body gives out. So then the doctor can go, okay, well, you know, I can give you a painkiller, but, but if you don't stop playing tennis or would learn to play it differently, if you don't change your, your behavior, there's not much I can do. The root cause, I can't, can't stop the root cause, only you can. Anyway, again, mm-hmm. again I hope that makes sense to you. It, it does make sense. So let's, let's pivot. Let's talk about first impressions. And I'm going to tell you something that's personal to me. Uh, yeah. Use this time to my advantage. So... I run a very successful company. I have 68 employees. I run a marketing and podcast agency. I have a number one podcast. When I meet new people, I feel like I don't get respect until I tell them what I've accomplished. Mm. And most people see me. I'm very feminine. I'm petite. I'm nice. I'm friendly. And I don't want to change that about myself. I don't want to change any of those things. I feel like it also works to my advantage. And... I'm wondering, how do I come across as powerful and uh, demanding of respect without having to say like, hey, this is everything I've accomplished, even though you probably think I work at the mall or something when you (laughs) see me. (laughs) Right. Okay. Well, look, their brain is a best guess machine. Okay. (laughs) And what it's doing is seeing the visual impact that you have. And the brain is going, what is my best guess? as to how I should perform around this other human being. How I should, where do I rank with them? Am I ranked above or below? What do you think our relationship will be? Will we get on with each other? And so their brain starts doing a whole bunch of best guesses around this. Mm -hmm. Now, look, you know, you are not, and you are not isolated. You're not just a human being, you're a human being in the world around a whole bunch of culture in a certain period of time and and so is that other human being so they're doing their best guess around around that look one of the things you we could always do and this won't necessarily every time for you but but sending people information ahead of time Mm. and, and i know this is not you just meeting somebody but sending people information ahead of time helps them evaluate at the far end of the spectrum if it were me you know and i was getting the same kind of response and remember at one point i was young like you (laughs) i wasn't i was taller than you i've always been taller than you uh but i had hair as long as yours which was odd for some of the the worlds that i i worked in and so, yes, yeah, some, some people who the information about me had got to them earlier, you know, would understand who they were dealing with and some just wouldn't. And so they'd make mistakes. Partly I had to go, well, that's just going to happen because I'm not showing up as their expectation of what I really am. My outward presentation is not expected. You know, and so it's a surprise to them and they get they get really com- you'd see moments of confusion, mm-hmm. you know, oh, it's, oh, you're the guy. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I thought you I thought you were something else, <laughs> you know, so so sending them the information ahead of time. Here's who you're getting. OK, let me ask you this. Hello. Who, who do you want people to know that you are? I'm really good at reading people, right? And I have a great online brand. So anybody who finds me online, they don't treat me like that, right? It's the people that I meet. Like yesterday, I was at a barbecue. I met a bunch of strangers. And when I'm like, oh, yeah, I run a company. I have 68 employees. They're like, really? Oh, (laughs) oh, wow. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's how they act. Like, oh, wow. Wow. And then they feel like, oh, like I can tell they're thinking, well, oh, I thought I was more successful than you. But, you you know, I could tell that that's kind of like the the attitude. And then and then things change and they're really interested in what I do and they're really interested in me. So it's it's just funny to it's just funny. And I know that when I I know myself. So in those situations, I'm always like, oh, what do you because I want to tell them what I do because I want quickly to them to realize that, like, like, hey, like, I'm not just, you know, a cute girl that's like here for no reason or, you know what I mean? I want them to know right away so that they treat me with respect and they treat me how I deserve to be treated. Sure. So, so look, there is an element of this. There is another way that we could go with this, which is to mm-hmm. say, 
you are a potentially a brilliant surprise for people. <laughs> There's something about you that could show up at a barbecue and have that, because it sounds from your description that very quick, that you are not afraid or ashamed or, or quiet about going, here's who you got here. You know, yeah. I've got, I've got to come, I do this. I'm really, I'm successful at this. And as you said, and they very quickly went, well, go, oh, wow. And they changed their behavior around you. They changed their assessment. So I'd question this, what is more interesting that they would look across the, the room and go, uh, oh yeah, there's a, there's a CEO of a, of a very successful company, young CEO, of a very successful company. Uh, I don't think I'll talk to that person. Uh, it doesn't really fit in with me. Uh, I'll do something else. And they, and they, and they were either for you or against you immediately, or actually they engage with you. They get this wonderful moment of surprise. They're good enough human beings that they can, uh, reestablish their idea of you. And they walk away from that going, you know what? The world is a very surprising place. <laughs> the, world <is> a, <laughs> the world is a really intriguing, barbecue's interesting <laughs> because you meet these people who you never expect, you know, are going to be what they, what they are. Because look, the alternative is you wear a cap that says, you know, important CEO, <laughs> and you, or and you I change my style, or, or you know, I feel like maybe if I wore a suit and I didn't wear makeup and I didn't do, but it's like that's not me. So I guess I got to just be me, and it is what it is. Well, look, I, I think I think the you know one of the, clearly one of the great things about you is that you are wonderfully surprising to to the world right now. In a decade's time, or twenty years' time, or maybe even next year people will look across the room at somebody like you and go, oh yeah, CEO of a, of a company, undoubtedly. Easy, easy to see, <laughs> you know, yeah. easy to see. And now you won't be a surprise to people yeah. anymore. Well, uh, let me you ask know. you this, as a, as a woman, I'm sure there's other mm -hmm. women listening in, how do you take up space? I know that's really oh. important. How do you take up space and be more powerful or seem more powerful than you are as a woman? Yeah, absolutely. So look, let me introduce you to the three circles that your gestures can okay. be in. Okay. So there's what I call first circle, which is where something on your arm, on your hands or your arms is always touching your, your body. So here I am in first circle. I'm in first circle right now. I'm in first circle. I'm still in first circle. Okay. Now I'm going to go to second circle, which means that there's always space between my body and my limbs. Okay, there's okay. always space there. Now, does one of me seem, I'm gonna gesture in, in the same plane. So, so I'm you know, at navel height here, it's a very confident plane and I'm in second circle here, or I'm gonna gesture in that same plane and I'm in first circle right now because I've got like, no gap between here and here. Okay, now, so he's got his arms me. folded like directly over his stomach, no, no gap. Right. In first right. circle. And in second circle, there's a gap between my hands and my body and even my elbows and my body. And, and then, so hopefully you're seeing that that one seems to have more power and more mm -hmm, authority. The bigger one, yeah. In second circle, okay? Now I'm going to go to third circle and, and you'll notice my, I, 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 my hands leave the frame. Mm. Now, third circle is... The, the arms lock out. This you'll often only see at, at big parties or rock and roll events or, you know, big performances, okay? Now again, do you, do you feel and see the power that's, that's in this? What I would suggest you do is use second circle just that little bit more, okay? Mm. That's all. Second circle just that little bit more because you will use up more territory. Instinct is that something that uses up territory has more power. If it takes more space, it has more power. If it has more power, we need to be careful around it. We need to respect it. We should not trouble it in, a, in any way. You know, we should be good to it. So now you've got to be careful with this because you don't want to take up other people's space. I mean, unless you really want mm. to.
Okay, unless you really, there's some there's some upside <laughs> and there's some downside to that. I mean, there's no bad body language, by the way. There's just results that you wanted or didn't want. I've got no judgment system of like, don't do this and don't do that. All I've got is if you want to achieve this result, the this is the route to go down. But there's some windows of opportunity there. So if we were together live in the same space and I'm going into third circle and I'm going into your space, into your personal space with that, you're going to get upset with me. Yeah, mm, I'm going to trigger. I'm going to think you're too much. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. going to trigger your fight and flight system with that, which either means you're going to start getting aggressive with me or you'll start getting passive with me or something in between. That might not be the relationship that I was looking for. Or maybe I was. There's no bad body language. There's just results that you wanted or didn't want. If I want the result of triggering you into aggression, then, yeah, I might want to go into third circle in your personal space. Mm. That, will, that will certainly cause you certain people to get more aggressive. Anyway, I, I love this advice. Sense. Yeah, it does. It does. I love that advice of second circle. I'm definitely going to try to use that more often. Mark, could we go over like 10, 15 minutes? Do you have the time? Oh, Are you yeah, able to? Okay, cool. Because I have a lot more to ask and this is a yeah, great conversation. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about uh, dating. There's lots of people, yeah. including myself. I got out of a 10-year relationship during COVID. A lot of people broke up with their significant others. A lot of people are getting back into dating. So I thought that we could do a quick fire segment. I'll rattle off a phase of dating and give me okay. your one minute best piece of advice okay. for each phase. Okay. Okay, right, quick fire. Right. It's going to be fun. Right. All right. So first phase, setting up a dating profile. What do we do? Yeah, interesting. Look, think about who you want to be seen as. Okay. This is you are projecting um, uh, some qualities. What are the qualities you want to be seen as having? And what qualities might you be looking for as well? Okay, so be really clear about here's who I want to project that I am. Okay, and, and that, that's okay. You're, you're, you're trying to show the, the best of you. Okay, we, we all understand that everybody's in the same thing. So don't be afraid to show the best of you and to have that ideal in your head of here's the best of me I want you to see. OK, and be really clear in the visual representation of that and the word representation of that. But also be really clear about what it is that you're looking for. What are the qualities that you're looking for as well? Because if you know, if you're not projecting some of those qualities, it might be hard for people to pick up on those, mm -hmm. you know, in in in. In the level of dating that is looking for um, somebody to spend a, a significant relationship with, you're looking, first of all, for actually very similar qualities. And that's what we call the infatuation stage. If you, if you want to, first of all, get into the infatuation stage, you've got to be showing some similarity of qualities and some ability to get on with others. Okay, mm. That stage will pass. Okay, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happens. But think about the qualities you want to project. Think about the qualities that you're looking for. And can you kind of encapsulate some of that into your profile? Hope now, is there sense. any tricks in terms of the pictures that we should choose? Well, again, it's, it's what are you, what effect are you trying to have? <laughs> okay. And, and if you can think about that effect and go and find photographs of people who you think are having that effect and mirror those photographs, yeah, that's probably a good route to go, mm -hmm. is, is some people will have already been able to have that effect on you. How can you copy that to have that same, uh, same effect? So again, there's no yeah, yeah. good or bad photographs. There's just results that you wanted or didn't want. Yeah. And I would say you, you want to look like yourself because nothing's worse than going on a date and the person doesn't even look like their photos or doesn't represent what their photos said. So I think you do want to have some level of it could be your best photos, but I think some level of accuracy. And then for me, if you're not writing anything about yourself on your profile, you are, you know, swiped away, <laughs> so right. to speak. So you got to so tell you. Yeah. Here's what you're trying to avoid by accuracy is, is, is what you're speaking to there is disappointment. 
Mm-hmm. If you if somebody shows up at a date and and it's some in their mind somebody different showed up, there's always an element of disappointment where they go, that's not that's not what was on the menu. Yeah, and that might be an awful, you know, metaphor to use, but ultimately that's the way the brain works. It saw a menu, it says, here's the opportunity, okay? And, and it goes, okay, swipe on that because that's that, I wanna take that opportunity. Mm-hmm. And then the reality shows up and the reality is so different from what was promised that there's a moment of disappointment okay. for All right. them. So next phase, preparing for your date. Mm. Again, don't feel bad about putting your best foot forward. Yeah, and I know everybody's going to want want to do that, but there is a there's an idea there of um, you know you got to show a a whole kind of reality around around stuff. I mean, social media is so pervasive, and we're able to get into so many parts of people's lives that you know. People can always search and find the the rounder you. <laughs> okay, they can always find, you know, many different facets to you. Think, be really clear about what's the facet of me that I really want to show up to this particular date. Mm. Who who do I want to project myself as? That isn't like I'm going to make up a version of me. That's what part of you do you most want to push forward? at this particular date because you know it's going to be good for you it's going to be fun for you it might well be attractive you think for them because you're trying to get the best for yourself yeah okay and so if you're trying to get the best for yourself push something forward that you feel is some of the best of you for this particular date which isn't everything if this first one goes well okay over time over time they'll see more of you and mm-hmm. more facets, but trying to think how many different facets of myself should I show at this date? It's like, make it easier for yourself. What is what is the one thing I really want to get across about myself at this yeah. date? What about you know? looking into the other person? Like, should you be Googling the other person and finding out about them and doing your studying up on them as well? Why not? I Google the plumber. I mean, and they're <laughs> just coming to fix like a blockage in the in the in the you know the tap they're just changing a washer so why so you're going out with somebody to to go hey here's an opportunity here's an opportunity why wouldn't you i mean i'm not saying you have to but why why sh- wouldn't you if if i google the plumber why wouldn't you google the person who you're, you're going on a date with i'm not saying you, you don't have to but but if people think well that's the wrong thing to do that's a bit weird I don't think it's very weird uh, at all. You know, Mm. uh, we had some people round to start lopping off branches of trees around around our 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 property. It's like I really researched them, found out what do other people say about them? Are they good? Are they you know what's Mm -hmm. what you know? Okay, well let me go on to their personal profile and see. It didn't take very long. And it soon gave me a picture of, you know, I feel pretty confident. This, the, I think I've made the right decision to get this person around. Okay. And that's yeah. somebody just cutting branches off a tree. Okay. So, so look, I, I, I got no problem with it. Yeah. Okay. So how about the first initial meeting and conversation? What's your best advice for a date? Yeah. So be interested. That's, that's the main thing. Be interested, be inquisitive, um, you know, inquire, see whether they reciprocate that. Are you inquisitive about them? Are they inquisitive about you? Does it seem to go only one way? That's always Mm. kind of interesting, you know, because the phone goes both ways. Social is both ways. And if I'm just, you know, just pushing my information at you, and at no point do I go, so hang on, I've been talking a long time. What, tell me, tell me about you. <laughs> you know, I'm in, intrigued about you. I'm curious about you. Yeah, if that doesn't happen, uh, that's interesting. That, that might tell you something. Like, you know, once in behavior, one of the things that we sometimes say is once is a pattern. <laughs> so, 
that if it doesn't, you know, if it's if they're not inquisitive once, they maybe are never going to be inquisitive. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's a, a big red flag. OK, yeah. so my last phase here is making the first move. Uh, and I think a lot, I've been going on a lot of dates and some guys have really been getting this wrong <laughs> where they go in for a kiss. And I'm like, no, no. What are you talking about? This didn't go that well. So how can you like how can you signal that it's not going well or how can somebody tell that it's not going well or tell that it is going well? Well, look, if I were to pick one factor, okay, if I were to pick one factor, <laughs> is that when people are getting on really, really well, they will close distance. In, in whatever relation, in, in whatever human relationship it is, they will close distance because there's a comfort level. OK, so, you know, if 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 we were, you know, out together, whether whether it was social or business, OK, I would be looking for are we going into spaces which have space and, and yet we're we're closing distance like you're you know, you're coming towards me or I'm coming towards you and you're not backing off further. Like, like if we started off in the middle of the bar and I keep moving forward and by the end of it, we're all the other side of it. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, well, this isn't, you know. Now, now the key around this is often you can end up going with somebody into an environment with a lot of people in where closed space is going to be the norm. You know, it's rather like taking them to to an elevator and going, oh, I think this is going well. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but you were in an elevator. So that's the norm <laughs> in, a, in an elevator. So, so what happens when you move into a bigger space? Are they still closing distance on you? You know, uh, look, there are a whole bunch of factors, but, but, but if, you, if you are not feeling a closing of space, yeah, then it's, you know, there's, there's more, there's more, there's more, more to work be done. to be done, <laughs> more, <laughs> more work to be done, more time, <laughs> more, you know, more conversation, more alignment, you know, anyway, I hope that's, that's awesome. Helpful. It is. It is. It is. OK, so let's talk about uh, your perspective of the need to be inauthentic. You know, we've got mm. this whole, you know, there's this whole movement about authenticity. You've got yes. to be authentic. Being yes. authentic is the way to be. It's the moral high ground. Inauthenticity is fake. Shouldn't fake it till you make it. I know you think this is a whole crack of BS. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about that. Yes. Well, it, it is from my point of view, simply because of the, the element that you put in there, which is the moral high ground. Mm-hmm. Once once uh, people start speaking about something with a mo- morality attached to it, then it starts in my mind, it starts to get kind of quasi religious. And so I've got to know. So where so where in some kind of writing, some where in some kind of philosophy, does it let me know what authentic would look like and what inauthentic would look like. How would I tell? How would I know what I'm what I'm doing? Because if you look at religions which deal with morality, they will be really quite specific. We can argue this where they're being specific. We can go, I think that's the wrong way to go on that. And that's the great thing about religion. It usually has a very strong rule book. You know that you can go to and go look it says here you do it like this if you don't do it like that it's immoral if you do it like this it's moral okay Mm. so the moment people start attaching morality to an idea like authenticity which is kind of up for grabs like what does that look like for you how how is that well you know it looks like whatever i want it to look like okay well then it's very difficult for us to align on our morality if you're going to make it moral like how are we going to get on around this oh and here's what's going to happen if you don't look to me like you're being authentic i will judge you as immoral i will i will authenticity shame you (laughs) and and, and i might not do it to your face but i'm probably going to do it to other people around around you and i'm going to go yeah but i don't think she was being authentic it's like how would how would you know how would anybody know like on what what criteria are you making that moral judgment with with other human beings? So that's my big worry about it. Is it's a nebulous term? It has no people took it out of its original 
criteria which which Jung formed around the idea of authenticity. They, it was taken outside of that, um, in my mind, by a very specific quasi-religious group who then coined the term universally and, and it started to get picked up and then it got, went into a, a common modern language of how to purport yourself, how to go about the world. Mm. It became a philosophy with no clarity to it and a moral judgment system around it. Yeah. So just very dangerous as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and when it comes to human behavior and how you present yourself, you need to be okay with getting out of your comfort zone. And for example, like we were talking about the first impressions and meaning me needing to start being more in second circle to take up space. If I right. do that, does that mean I'm fake? No, it means no, that I'm because... stepping out of my comfort zone and I'm trying to portray who I am because you're judging me without me even like because I haven't been doing those actions or you know right. what I mean? So it's it's trying to be the best version of yourself. Right. Exactly. You're living on purpose. Like, like if you like if it if it were not authentically part of you, you physically wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. You just go, I can't actually. And maybe maybe it would still still just feel like that. I go, I know it feels like you can't go into second circle, but let's work together on getting more comfortable or dealing with the discomfort of these behaviors because they are you. They are you. It's just it's just you're not used to them. And so therefore they feel less comfortable, but they will more likely get you the results that you want. You know, this is and, and look, Hala, have you have you got where you are today, which is which is a, an excellent level, a level of excellence that you keep on, you know, pushing forward on. Have you got there by being wholly comfortable all the time? Or were there oh, moments? No, where, I'm always right. uncomfortable. Always. <laughs> right, right. But I'm, I'm I get more comfortable and more com like, you know, every time you do it once, then the next time it's second nature. You know, you get used to it and more used to it. Right. So some people might go, so we, we get that. Yeah, and I totally understand that. But some people in, in the moral authenticity realm would go, but why don't you just show us that discomfort? So what's your reasoning for not showing us that, that inner discomfort, you know, when you are pushing your boundaries? Because I want to portray as, like who I want to be, even if I'm not that yet. Right. So, so, so you're wanting to portray who you want to be, even if you're not that yet. For me, that's, an, that, that's about authorship. I want to write this story that isn't necessarily absolutely true right now. I want to write the story. That, for me, is authenticity. When you write your story on purpose, okay? Mm. That's, that, for me, is what authenticity is really about. I'm writing this story on purpose and like any writer any really good writer it's really uncomfortable okay all of them will go well you go how do you write that book it's like it really hurt like it was really hard work <laughs> to come up with that that idea that to, to make something that wasn't fully formed into something fully formed that communicates to other people and makes their lives better like that was really tough work and it's the same as as creating and authoring and being authentic a version of you it's not about comfort it's about pushing through and managing the discomfort of being something more than the world would have you be if, if you were just comfortable yeah, <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> right. my last question to you before we start to wind down because i know we're way over time and thank you sure. so much for your time my pleasure is you did mention storytelling and mm. I, I heard you in an interview and you said something really powerful you said that the truth and the facts are not the same and i really resonated with this because i think i'm a great storyteller especially when I go on these podcast interviews. And sometimes I'll embellish stories, not because I want to lie, but because I'm trying to get the emphasis of the story across and connect with the audience. So talk to us about why facts and the truth are actually not the same and what a great storyteller is. Yeah. So my best friend once told me, 
Do not let the cold, dead hand of reason get in the way of a good story. Okay, mm. so, so we've got to know the difference between story and truth and fact. So fact is a discernible thing that you need, uh, you know, more than three people to have something sensible. It means they can literally sense it and they can all corroborate to go, we sense the same thing, therefore it is factually act accurate. Again, factually accurate, not true, <laughs> factually accurate. Now, mm. truth is, is way more complex. So we can have some factually accurate things that we can create a truth from as well, which means the truth will communicate to even more people and will have even more value. value. Facts don't necessarily have much value to some people. It's like, who cares? Well, it's a fact, who cares, okay? Truth tends to uh, hit something innate about us that we go, yeah that's, yeah, that's how the world is. And so there will be the idea of your truth. It's like, but that's, that's the way I see it. That's my truth. It's like, okay, I get it. Doesn't mean it's factually accurate at all don't like don't mix the two things up don't get them confused i'm totally happy for you to go look that's that's the truth as i see it okay but but you can't do like that's the fact as i see it well d who else sees that fact can we if you can get me more than three people like now now we're, we're somewhat getting towards a fact which isn't necessarily the truth and when it comes to good storytelling like exaggeration and repetition and rhythm and and um uh you know humanity are all elements in a story that can help people understand the truth of it but facts don't need to be any part of that they don't need to be they could be but they don't have to be mm -hmm. Yeah, which means you've got to be careful as somebody who who if you're into behavior and you like to read body language and you like to look for deceit and exaggeration is you'll become a, a really annoying person if you keep interrupting people's stories and going, well, th that's not a fact. <laughs> so it doesn't, well, no, obviously not. They're not being factual right now. They're telling you a story in order to have an effect and, and, and tell you the truth about the world that they see. And, and yes, they might use the word fact, but they probably don't have one. And now you've got to decide whether you go, well, sorry, that, but that isn't a fact. Or whether you just let them tell the story that it's, it's factual, okay? And how, how important it is, is it that you, that you take them up that their facts aren't facts, okay? Mm. You, again, you've got to, you've got to understand your, um, your value system. What, thing, what facts do you value most that you will never let be corrupted? And all other facts, don't matter. Don't matter, yeah. just whatever. Anyway, I hope that makes that. That's it, it does make you. sense. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you're way over. So the last question I ask all my guests on Young and Profiting Podcast is what is your secret to profiting in life? Wow, that's a super question. Yeah, okay. Um, just, just making a clear choice. Just trying to concentrate on one thing, okay? Uh, again, one of, my, one of my greatest teachers ever, and he got it from his teacher as, as well, said, make a choice, uh, make it bigger, keep it tidy. Make a choice, make it bigger, keep it tidy. So decide on what it is, okay? Now understand your decision on what it is is not big enough. They're never going to be able to see it. It's too small. Okay. You may, you've gone too small. Make that bigger now. Okay. So everybody can see it and it's really clear for you. Okay. Now what's going to happen is you're going to go, oh, but if I added a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other, more people would like it and, and it'd be prettier and nicer and more amazing or more delicate or, you know, just might not look so bold and get attacked so much. Keep it tidy. Just make the choice and make it bigger keep it tidy don't add a, a, other stuff to it because if you get that clarity of communication about what it is uh to others and to yourself you have you have more chance that you and other people will get it 
Now, at the same mm-hmm. time, there's a risk to that, by the way. Some people will get it more and they won't like it. So you're going to get more people who potentially like it because they can see it and more people who dislike it. So they can't. Mm-hmm. So I want to just quote uh, an, another uh, a, you know, hero of mine, Banksy, the artist Banksy, who says they either love me or they hate me or they have no idea who I am. Mm. So I think that's an, that's an important adage as well. I love that. Those, those are great things. And where can our listeners go to learn more about you and everything? Where can our listeners go learn about you and everything that you do? Yeah, just find me at truthplane.com, T-R-U-T-H-P-L-A-N-E, truthplane.com or Google Mark Bowden and up I'll come for you. Amazing. I'll put all his links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Mark. This was an awesome conversation. I could talk to you for hours. I feel like we have a whole other sales conversation to have later in the year. Um, I'm just, you know, so happy to have you as a friend and a collaborator. And thank you again for coming on the podcast. It was wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to be with you. I'll come back to talk to you and the audience anytime. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team as always. This is Hala signing off.